Elena, we are so excited for you to be here today. Um, I just kind of want to get started right off the bat. You are a uh, licensed social worker and a clinical hypnotherapist. Correct. Yes. And I was, t- <laughs> I was talking to Leah about it and she's like, okay, but like, what is a hypnotherapist? Yeah, it. it's a good question. So <laughs> when I started in therapy, we were, it felt like we were just hitting surface level things. So we were talking about the same issue over and over and over again. And I was like, there just has to be more that I can do for people. And I had learned about EMDR, you know, early on in my training. Um, but I learned about hypnosis and then specifically past life regression. And that really intrigued me. And so I went to Sedona and did a 10 day training to do past life regression. And that was 15 years ago now at this point, which is mind blowing that it's been that long. And so then I just progressed with that. So the hypnotherapy allows us to go into the subconscious and see what the soul the mind, the body is holding on to. So, you know, we tuck away memories, we tuck away traumas, we tuck away emotions, and we can't always consciously say what it is. We know that something's bothering us, but we don't know what exactly it is. And even if we know generally what it is that has happened to us, we, it's very hard for us to remember or to even know like what our soul exactly is so hurt by. So with the um, hypnosis and the way that I do it, we go right into that issue. So if somebody comes to me um, for weight loss and it's because of like emotional eating, eating your feelings, um, when we go into that underlying, we could be going into one thing one kid said on the beach when you were 11 years old and you might have like a like oh i kind of remember that happening but for some reason your soul just latches onto that and it affects you throughout your entire lifetime um and then of course you know other comments other things um and so that that hypnosis piece allows us to get in and kind of go below the surface and get to the root cause so yeah. I feel I feel like a lot of people don't realize that. My family and I we, we were talking about somebody who um somebody someone we know that is struggling with his life and then we started talking about his childhood mm-hmm. and um how his dad parented him and his dad was really hard and you know he he we remember him telling us this story about how um He came home one day and he got beat up by someone in his class and Mm -hmm. his dad berated him and put him in the car and drove him over to that kid's house and was like, you cannot get back into my car Mm -hmm. unless like you win that fight. Like you beat that. I just got chills. Mm -hmm. So now he has turned into an adult with anger issues and, and, you know, is it really struggles, but I see this wounded little boy who never yep. healed but i think a lot of adults don't really realize that it correlates back to something deeper yeah. they're just focusing on what's present instead of like how it started and the root like what you said mm-hmm. so i think that is that is very interesting and a lot of people come to us not necessarily realizing that you know, when we bring up uh, psychedelics and how it maybe goes into things that we don't even know were there and it Mm -hmm. brings them out. So yes, thank you for doing the work that you do. Yeah. Inner child healing is a huge part of my practice because, you know, when I got into it, I didn't even know that term. That was before that term was widely understood. But then when I would start to work with somebody on anxiety, depression, anger, weight loss, everything we would go back to childhood even babyhood like when they're a teeny tiny baby and the parents are fighting in the next room and then we'd go to past lives and I'm like oh my gosh like this could be a never ending (laughs) thing that we need to do but you know for weight loss I've struggled with my weight throughout my whole life major body image issues and I've done so much healing 
inner child wise, but also having to go back to past lives. And it is that, you know, you mentioned the psychedelics and that was kind of how, that was my next step was like, okay, hypnosis is getting to the root cause in the past life is bringing in that metaphysical and spiritual aspect, but the psychedelics really, really, really allow us to go beyond the veil yeah. and really dive into those particular wounds that we might be carrying for lifetimes. So we just did, um, we saved a clip from another episode previously that was saying, you know, for people who don't understand like psychedelics and how they work for you, like, how would you explain that to someone who's like, oh, I don't need to do that. You know, I feel my feelings just fine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the way she said it was like, you know, if you're dealing with an issue, continue to ask yourself why. And once mm -hmm. you figure out the why, allow the mushrooms to assist you in the why or the psychedelics. And it kind of mm -hmm. sounds like what you're saying um, with, you know, you can unpack those things, but then it's like, you're sitting there and you're like, okay, now what, mm -hmm. what am I supposed to do with this? Yeah. And I, I want to say something about the EMDR versus the hypnotherapy. Um, you know, I read uh, Brian Weiss's book, many lives, many masters mm -hmm. last year. And it sounds like a lot like what you're doing. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He doing. was like the OG person yeah. that made it famous but yeah yeah mm -hmm. I was like explaining to Christine I was like I don't even think he meant he didn't mean to do the past lives thing he was a hypnotherapist and then the past lives started happening and he's like mm -hmm. what the fuck? but yeah. um for I'm gonna use my husband as an example here he disassociated a lot in his childhood mm -hmm. he doesn't have any memories so he mm -hmm. tried to do EMDR and with the EMDR you have to have a memory to like work through mm. that. He, so he struggled yeah. with it because he was like, I don't know, like maybe this one time this thing happened. Yeah. Um, I think hypnotherapy would be something more suited for him or someone who doesn't quite understand where it's coming from because then you're like diving deeper. A hundred percent. Yes, okay. exactly. Exactly. Because the other piece of that, that I do, and this is all things that just have developed over so many years of doing this and working with so many different people and finding what works. And, um, the other thing is that, so that is a very common issue that people feel like they don't have a lot of memories from their childhood. And that can come from trauma where we disassociate and aren't like fully locked into it but I've even found it with my sister. So she was the fourth. So there's not that many pictures. And also she wasn't sitting around like when, when I was little, we would sit at the kitchen table at my grandma's and rehash and talk about all the stories over and over again and be like, remember that one time when this happened? And so it really locked it in. And she's like, I just don't have that many. And I was like, yeah, you kind of missed out on that neural path, those neural pathways getting formed in these very core memories that I have. And so there can be different reasons for that. But yeah, the hypnosis and the way that I do it, even if somebody doesn't have, um, and it's very rare that there's not some type of memory that comes up when we deal with the presenting issue, but sometimes it's more so what they're feeling in their body. So if we're talking about guilt, that might be something that you feel like a burning in your belly about, or you might have neck pain. And so we will talk to your body and let your body talk to you, or sometimes it just wants to be released. So we don't have to rehash every little thing that happened. We just need to go to where your soul and subconscious needs to go. Hmm. Damn. Okay. Can you I, like and feel your like book. wheels turning? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. yeah. <laughs> We've never talked to anybody about this before. We're like two kids in a candy shop right now. Yeah. Yes. I have clients all over the world, so it can be done virtually. Okay. Well, I was going to say, I don't remember a lot of not just my childhood, but I feel like even like teenage years, like mm -hmm. those are very vague for me. Mm -hmm. um, so Hmm. I know. Interesting. So when did the psychedelics come into play? When did that? Yeah. So I had been interested. So like I said, I'm always searching for what can I do? What can I offer that helps my clients heal even more? Because, you know, I'm... I am a true empath, you know, that word gets thrown around a lot, but I feel other people's pain. And it took me a lot of years to even realize that that's what was happening. Um, 
And so, you know, when I'm sitting with somebody and we're working through traumas and we're working through hurts, I'm feeling that. So, of course, I want to alleviate that for them in the best ways possible. And so I started just picking up on the research of like, oh, they're doing real deal research studies on psychedelics, on the ketamine, the MDMA, um, the psilocybin, and that really started to pique my interest. And then um, our son died in um, December of 2021, and it it just completely shattered um, our world. And I've had a lot of traumatic deaths in my life. I'm actually almost like this close to being done with my memoir focused on my grief journey. Um, and one of the things that I've tried to do in the midst of all of these tragic losses is find the blessing and the lesson in that. And so when our son died, it was like, okay, how do I start to shift this? I have three other children. I cannot let this destroy me. Um, I have a thriving business. I need to show up for my clients in the best way that I can, but I have to be okay. You know, I have to be okay in order for everybody else to be okay. And so kind of everything was on the table. Every single tool, practice, everything that I'd ever read of, heard of, done, taught other people. And one of those that I hadn't yet crossed into was the plant medicine. Um, I was I'm a weird mix of like a goody two shoes and then also a rebel. <laughs> so, that's, me. that's me. I won't so a rebel. Was, I, yeah. I do a lot of flicks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's so fun. I um, had never just kind of crossed that, but then it was like, all right, let's go for it. Um, and I have a, a very good friend who um, is a shaman. And so, um, you know, when we did the the journey, we brought in the sacredness, the intention, the um, the music, you know, that soul music that you can, the drumming, the the mouth harmonica uh, or the, the mouth strumming um, during the journey. And, you know, with the intention of allowing me to heal from this massive trauma. And, you know, that's the thing about trauma is, yes, the death itself was terrible and devastating, but sure. it's all of the other things around it. It's having to talk to my children about their brother dying. It's, you know, losing a child and then having to plan a funeral service, leaking body fluids, trying to dry up the milk. That pain was so bad, you know, and I'm hugging all these people and trying to like put an arm and hug, you know, so I'm trying, it, it, I had a fourth degree tear. I, you know, it was just like, pain after pain after pain after pain um you know telling the grandparents watching my my the, his great grandmother sing to him you know in the funeral home before we had him cremated just all of these memories the smells you know you've got i've got hospital smells witch hazel because i was like putting witch hazel on that fourth degree tear like nobody's business so that that smell of witch hazel um you know so there was just all of these layers of those hurts and so when I looked at the the psychedelics, it was like, okay, this can allow me to actually move through all of that and find that peace, find what his purpose was. Because I do believe in my heart of hearts that we know ahead of time, every we have everything planned out. We have soul contracts. We know how long we're going to be here. We know who we're marrying. We know who our children are going to be. Same thing for our children. So, you know, I see my husband and I as the conduit for these children. We're not in charge of them. Um, they are their own souls. And so, you know, Bodhi fulfilled his purpose in those nine months of being in my belly. But what was that? Why did he come? And why was it only for such a short time? And, you know, working through guilt and regret and just all of those emotions um, on the other side of that, too. So, Bodhi is yeah, my brother's name. Oh, really? Oh, my goodness. Yeah. yeah. I'm I've, so, I'm very sorry about your loss, yeah. by the way. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I, think, um, I don't think a lot of people, okay, so I, I was hearing you say, you know, talking about the witch hazel being triggering and the smell of hospitals being triggering. Mm -hmm. And how many other kids did you say you have? Three. Three other kids. Okay. I'm thinking about this because they say, you know, trauma isn't what happened 
um, to you. It's, it's, it's what happened inside of you during that time. Mm-hmm. So I'm like thinking, you know, I've had three kids, like the smell of hospitals. You've been in hospitals before. The smell of hospitals probably was never a trigger for you before, but it, mm-hmm. for this situation, this time, those things that were happening around you all get like stuck in your memory. Yep. You know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, and that's exactly it. You know, well, so two of my children were NICU babies and, um, even just going to that hospital. So that was a separate hospital and going to that floor. Like I would feel that in my hips and in my low back when I would, you know, go to that elevator and go to that particular floor. And then the same thing happened. So we were actually a planned home birth and then we transferred to the hospital and he died on the way to the hospital. And, um, so I was not planning on seeing an OB, but then having to follow up with that OB. And so then when I went there, so I just donated a kidney to my dad too. Um, so that I'm like four weeks out from that. <laughs> yeah. Oh my goodness. So like, I had now, to, like, yes, now? like just now, yeah, I'm still <laughs> recovering. Um, yes. so I had to go because when you donate a kidney, they do like every testing under the sun to make sure you're healthy enough to do that. And so I had to go to, you know, get the pap and the mammogram and all that kind of stuff. And I walked into that office and the last time I had been there was the one week follow up after Bodhi had died. And I just felt that wave of just heat and sadness and anger and just everything just kind of just wash through me. And, you know, I you just swallowed it down while I was there. But yeah, the body holds on to that. I would have never consciously said, oh, when I walk into Steve or uh, the doctor's office, I'm going to for sure feel this. But my body remembered and that all happened. So yeah. So the medicine helped assist you in, I guess it helped assist you in the why, like mm-hmm. your your journey was about finding meaning or purpose in that? Or was it about really just trying to move through that grief? Both. I would definitely say both. I think it allowed me to, yeah, see what the possibilities could be as to why he would have such a short life and what that meant for me moving forward, what it meant for my husband, you know, for our family. And, um, it allowed me to then heal. So in the book that I'm writing, I talk about the actual deaths, but also death of self. And the death of self are basically the self-imposed limits that I put on myself throughout my life. And so I feel like um, his death, the plant medicine, the other tools that I used allowed that final falling away. So they had been slowly kind of moving away when my college boyfriend died, when my brother died, when my uncle died, you know, all of that stuff, it it brings that all to the surface. You know, you can turn it inward and berate and belittle yourself. You can turn it outward and anger. You know, there's so many ways that it can become toxic, but with Bodhi's death and then the plant medicine, it was like, okay, all right. So like, I need to just let go of questioning signs and symbols and synchronicities. I need to let go of thinking that I'm not good enough. I need to let go of um, putting limits on my business. I need to let go of worrying what other people think, you know, so is that kind of final falling away that both of those things really allowed for me. So yes, it was the, the blessing, the purpose, um, but also on the other side, like, okay, what does this mean for me moving forward? Because I'm still here. So there's still more that I need to do. Cause I, I do think I could have probably checked out with him. Um, I definitely had a lot of complications and, you know, so I think, you know, that was a possibility on the table, but I stayed. So now I got to get my act together and figure out what I need to do with all of this. Yeah. Wow. Is I'm, I'm going to ask a parenting question. Um, because we, we do have listeners who have, uh, lost a child Mm -hmm. and, um, what the process was for you trying to help your children, your, your family, your husband too, um, with their grief while also like having your own grief. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's a, our situation is a little bit different. So, um, my kids were 
So it'll be two years on December 6th. So they were six, eight, and 12. Um, mm. So even at that age, I still feel like pregnancy is pretty abstract. Like, obviously, they're seeing my belly grow and they have other siblings, you know, other cousins. So they know that there's a baby that comes at the end. But he was never here. And yeah. so it it was... I almost feel like I've had to navigate acknowledging his existence without traumatizing them more. Like you need to like, no, you have three brothers. No, there's four children, you know, and not making it about him or me or, you know, those kinds of things, but yet still holding space and honoring that he is their sibling. He did exist. Um, but, you know, in our family, we are pretty open and spiritual and talk about death and talk about the other side and our beliefs around that. So I think that's the biggest thing. And, you know, for us, our particular issue was that our six-year-old got a lot of anxiety after that. And so his worry was, well, he, so he would cry and say, what if something happens to you and dad? I would really miss you. What if something happens to me? I don't know. I don't remember what it's like on the other side. And so like, those were the themes that would just come up for him. And so I can't make false promises because there's been so many people that have died in my life young. So I can't say like, well, we're, you know, we'll be, we're going to live long lives. Cause I've heard that before. And I'm like, well, you don't know that. So, you know, don't do that. Um, or, you know, people can decide how they handle things. But for me, I said, we don't know. I, tomorrow is not guaranteed. So let's have as much fun as we can have today. Let's hug and give kisses and play and go outside and do all of the things that we can do today. In that way, we are just living our best lives every single day. And so that's kind of how we focused in on it. And really try to honor him by having more fun and coming together. And then also just not making, for me, it was important to not make false promises because I don't know, um, you know, when my time is going to be up too. So does that make sense? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. I, I think yeah. that that is, um, I don't know. I'm finding myself having like more realistic approaches with my kids, um, and their anxieties and their fears. And, I think the the version, the mother that I was four years ago, even would handle situations very different than I do now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, my daughter has anxiety. She's a gymnast. She talks about it sometimes. And the way that I talk to her about it is I'm, I'm more understand. I understand it more. Like I had mm -hmm. anxiety four years ago, but I didn't know how to deal with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and so I don't know. I think that like there is a part of healing that comes when you're a parent where you are able to help your children deal with these nuanced feelings and things that they're going to always have to deal with. I think it's very unrealistic to say you're never going to have anxiety and you're never mm -hmm. going to lose anxiety and everything's going to be fine. Like yeah. you're setting them up for, I mean, just failure because they're, mm -hmm. they're going to have it. And then they're going to think there's something wrong with them. Yes, you know? exactly. Exactly. So. And that was important to me because I feel like that was one thing that happened to me or a, a, one of the beliefs that I needed to let go of was that if I was a good person, that good things would happen to me. And I think it was a religious belief somewhere along the way, like that if you pray hard enough, that if you do enough good things, that your life is going to be quote unquote good. And right. so that was one of those unpacking things where it was like, no, actually, like, very terrible things can happen to very wonderful people. Um, and so, you know, moving through that and yeah, like letting them build resilience around anxiety is real, depression is real, trauma is real. But what do we do with it? We don't have to stay there. We can honor it. We can feel our feelings. We can acknowledge it. But let's not stay in it forever. And so I think that's, that's kind of how I look at it and try to help my kids through that. Yeah. yeah. Has, um, how has plant medicine changed the way that you parent, do you think? Oh gosh. Yeah. So I am 
my, my nickname in college was No Fun Elena, which is not fair because I was very fun. But one time I didn't want to go out. But there was definitely like an undercurrent of truth to that, of <laughs> where I was like the very serious, very like, we're going to get in trouble. We can't do that. You know, um, we need to clean the house. We need to do basically our chores before we can go out and do fun things. And that wasn't just in college. That was my whole life. And I mean, I still struggle with that particular thing. But I think the plant medicine helped me let go of some of that because that was just self-imposed expectations. Like nobody actually cares if my house is messy, except for me. Nobody actually cares if my car is cleaned out. Um, and if they do, Oh, well, like that's their problem, you know, so it has allowed me to just be more fun and go more places and um, kind of just let loose to where it's like, oh, yeah, like going paddle boarding is way more important than getting the yard cleaned up. We can do the yard later or tomorrow. Absolutely. And yeah. So I think that's the biggest thing. And I, I've always strived to see the beauty in everything. Um, but I think plant medicine really opened my eyes to very nuanced beauty. I was joking. I sent a message to my friend the other day and I was like, I got to stop microdosing during fall because it's just too beautiful. I can't take it. <laughs> okay. It's like just so pretty. He's a leaf and... <laughs> yeah. I really need to stop microdosing because this is magnificent. <laughs> and it is distracting. So I call it like the Instagram filter for life. Yes, yes. Yeah. You're not it's not a filter. You're seeing what's actually there. It's almost yeah. like you're taking the filter away. Away. So mm -hmm. But yeah. yeah, and I think that's your yeah, those synapses open so you can see more nuanced color and you can appreciate it more because you're not just in this constant whirlwind of chaos. So yeah, it was so funny. Have you and your husband done plant medicine together or has it just been like a solo journey for you? Yes, we have done it together. And um, yeah, I would like to do it again because um, I was kind of more, it was his first time. So I was more worried about him than being focused on my journey. So I would like to do that again. We just haven't um, done that yet, but yes. We keep trying, like my husband and I have three kids too. So like trying to find like a night or a weekend where we don't have them, like mm -hmm. he's done three separate journeys. I've done four separate journeys and we're like, next time we need to do it together. Yes. But it's like, we both needed to be comfortable with it first before mm -hmm. doing it at the same time. Um, I kind of wanted to piggyback on what we were just talking about, like the beauty and everything. I've been listening to this podcast series lately about the most important aspects of, of healthy mental health, like good, having good mental health. And two of the most important things is agency and gratitude. And if mm. you can have a sense of agency and gratitude, you are like better off than most people who don't have those things already. Mm. Um, and the whole gratitude thing, like my kids were making fun of me yesterday because we were driving and I have like a car thing that holds my phone. I was recording the sunset while I was driving and I'm like, do you guys see this? <laughs> How gorgeous. And they're like, okay, mom, in the middle of recording it, my husband is like two hours away, sends me a photo of the sunset and mm -hmm. I'm like, Shut up. I am literally dying at the sunset right now. And he's like, oh, you see it too? But it's just those little moments of yeah. like gratitude for being alive and being able to witness that and having this like realization that like you're so small in the grand scheme of things, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah we <laughs> yeah see it's it'll shift though because now my kids are like mom go look at the sunrise mama go look at the sunrise or they'll be like did you see the rainbow or you know so they're pointing out things to me now but um yeah we i when my kids were little my husband worked away and lived away and so in the summer i was like okay we got to get out of this house and so we started hiking and we committed to one day a week every week of the summer and you know so i think my kids have actually been the ones that like slowed me down. Cause I'm more of like, a, okay, we're going to do 10 miles today. And so we got to get our butts in gear and, you know, get this far instead of slowing down and enjoying the process of obviously we didn't do 10 miles when my kids were little, but 
Um, yeah. <laughs> we were lucky if we made it two. Um, but <laughs> but they were the they were the ones looking at the the drops of water on the leaves or stopping to see, um, you know, pick up rocks or pick up a cool stick. And um, so it's been a really neat back and forth of that. But yeah, my husband will send me sunrise and sunset pictures. He picks up feathers for me, all of those things that I've now infused to all of the people around me too. So it's fun. Like, think about that, how like kids just instinctively have like we learn so much from our kids and that like idea of slowing down goes so long so in so many aspects across life because it's like it's not about the destination like yeah if we do this two mile hike there's a waterfall at the end of it but like if you're slowing down it's the journey Mm -hmm. of that two miles where you're like oh look at this caterpillar oh look at this leaf yeah I think so often like parents are rushed like come on we got to get to the end come on we got to the mm-hmm. waterfall at the end and yeah. they're missing all those little things in between. Yeah. It's such a and metaphor for life. It is. It's such a metaphor for life. And I think that's the one neat thing about the plant medicine too, is that um, we were just talking about this, um, the, the person that, and I that lead or help people integrate their journeys and um, do the music and all of that. Um, we will see in the physical world manifested whatever happened in the journey. So the I my life has been insane the last couple months and um like just so busy. And the one of the journeys that I did before like things were like next level busy um was to slow down, get more connected, be more present, be more aware. And I go to fold up my chair at the end and there's a snail sitting underneath my chair. And I was like, oh my gosh, that was like, my whole journey was about connecting with my ancestors and slowing down. And then there's a snail right there. And snails are not common in our area. It's not like, you know, there's snails everywhere or anything like that. So yeah, that was a wild thing. And it was that, yeah, like slow down, take it all in. And it it has been an important message for me because I did a big trip and then I had this surgery. So I've had to slow down. So. I love that. I love that. So I'll, I kind of want to go back to the past life regression because mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't think a lot of people know what that means. I'm still unsure because I've never done a reading before. Mm-hmm. Or a session. I don't know how you say it. Um, uh, yeah, I actually offer both. So the the session, okay. and, and I'll let you ask your question, but the session is where, what I call a session is where the the client goes back into the lifetime and goes back through the practical stuff and the um, forgiveness, important events, all of the healing, the purpose for that lifetime, people that might be from that lifetime that are in their current life, all of those kinds of things. The reading is where um, I use cards and we talk about um, maybe one or maybe three past lives. And I'm actually telling the person about that and how it's correlating to their current life. So there are kind of two separate ways. Uh, Yeah, There is a difference. Educate us. (laughs) (laughs) Love this. So, and again, I'm, I'm going to go back again to yes. with the hypnotherapy. Um, like, I think that that's something that I would be interested in, but is there anybody that wouldn't be a good candidate for it? The or only you think people, everyone? I think everybody can benefit. Um, if somebody has a lower IQ, you know, that is going to be um, a rule out. If somebody has psychosis, like real deal, um, hallucinations, delusions, then that would not be a good fit for people. Um, I do have people that have struggled with that, um, but we do more of relaxation, sound um, healing, those types of things, um, because I do have the therapy background, so I can handle that, but we just don't do um, the past lives and, and that kind of stuff. Okay. How did you get into this space? How did you like start on your healing journey and, and become yeah. a- Oh, goodness. Um, okay. So, so because I've been writing my memoir, it's like all here in the That's- forefront. Yes. So I have always had the ability to see um, dead people. Um, so when I was little, I saw my sister who had died and my aunt who had died. But I didn't know. I didn't understand. Um, And 
I grew up very Catholic. So, you know, that stuff is usually very frowned upon in that religion. Can I ask what you sure. mean by you saw them? Um, Like we would be at my grandma's house and they would just be there. Like, you know, they were just part of, like, it was, you know, all the aunts and uncles and all the cousins. So they're part of the family and they were just there too. So, so were you like, um, dad, no, anybody see there it? was something so within me that just was like, oh, they're just here. Like it didn't seem odd okay. or off to me. And I was little, little, like four. And I actually just came across a video where, um, it was my great grandma's hundredth birthday. So my uncle had rented a video camera, <laughs> rented it. And oh my gosh, was back video, in the day. <laughs> yeah, like he wanted to interview her and then walked around and there was a video and the things that I was seeing, I was like, Oh yeah, that was when it was like very prevalent for me because I was talking about stuff that a normal, quote unquote, normal four year old would just not be able to like connect or put together. Um but then that all, so my grandma was very Catholic, but also got her tea leaves red, you know, very Catholic, prayed the novenas, but went and saw mediums and things. So I kind of grew up with both um, things and I wasn't particularly into it. It was just something that I knew about. Um, and then um, kind of just like shut that all down for the most part. But in college, my um college boyfriend died in a car accident. And after his, so I was in England when he died and things started happening right away. Like the signs and the symbols and the synchronicities and they're, they're like mind blowing. And, um, so that started opening me back up to like, okay, there's like more, he didn't just go away. Like he's still trying to let me know he's here. And then my, um, in 2007, my brother died. And so when he died, that was when it all, like we went to Lilydale to see mediums. We had mediums coming to my mom's house. Um, he died by suicide. And so there was just so much extra emotion that came in with that, that we were, it was kind of that same thing where we're looking for things to help us feel better, to soothe all of those hurts. Um, and so, you know, just opening back up to that, that allowed me to start to open up my gifts again. And so, and I actually don't know how I found the training. Um, what I've come to, cause it was before Google existed, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, back in the olden days, um, <laughs> we're in these guys just yeah, for the right. Yeah. 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 So I think it must've been an advertisement in the back of a magazine. Do you remember how they used to do that? Yes. That was like, you know, like, a That's you know, yeah, classifieds or, yeah. yeah. So, um, so the lady lived in the Midwest, but then she taught down in Sedona and I didn't even know what Sedona was. I had no clue. I didn't know any of that kind of that stuff at that time and went down there and did that training. And it just like blew my mind. I, I just blew my mind. So that was when I really got into just that there is way more to life than what we can see with our physical eyes and what we, what most of us believe to be true and just allow me to just keep opening up to those possibilities. And I think that's the plant medicine too, you know, 16 years later from when that all started and 20 years from when my college, you know, like all of those things just keep allowing me to expand, keep allowing me to grow and see more and more possibilities. So. Wow. What a gift. I know. It's like, mm -hmm. I wish I had. <laughs> <laughs> I want to see dead people. The whole mm -hmm. like synchronicity thing. Um, you know, that's been happening to me a lot over the last few years, but we've, we've talked about this in our last episode that just dropped about how, like, until you're really open to that, you, you don't pay attention mm -hmm. to those little signs and those little synchronicities. And I'm just going to say this because I need to put this on record before you got here this morning, Christine, I was Googling Bodhi trees. 
No oh, way. I mean, you said you're, I swear I can show you right now my Google history because I was learning about like the Lotus at the bottom of the Bodhi tree and how Buddha like sat there for 49 hours and meditated. And mm. that was the significance of the Bodhi tree. I'm, yeah. And it's like supposed to be the tree of life. I'm like, oh my gosh, I have so many chills right now. I, that's, that's amazing. Like, the first time you said Bodhi and then you said your brother's name was Bodhi and I'm sitting here like, <laughs> holy oh crap, God. holy crap, holy crap. <laughs> Literally, because I'm like, this is wild. Wow. We were meant to interview you today. I know. For yes. sure. So talk about signs. Just like, <laughs> wow. You know. That is amazing. I love that. So, was so your let's... brother named Bodhi from, like, how does he spell it? B O D I. Okay. Uh, so, I went with the B O D H I, for, short for the Bodhi okay. Sattva from okay. Buddhism. But then also, do you remember? Um, the uh, 90s movie Point Break with Patrick Swayze. Yeah. His name was Bodhi. And I oh. always loved that name. And then I like, it all just like clicked during that pregnancy. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is our name. And my husband was like, I don't know. And then when he died, he was like, what was that name that you wanted? So yeah. <laughs> I, I love, I was going to name it, my son Bodhi actually. Oh my it, gosh. Uh, but I didn't, I didn't go with it. I went, I went with Kai, but yeah, yeah. that was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was going to be Bodhi or Kai, and we went with Kai. So we those are both great names. So yeah, <laughs> today this is amazing. Yeah. Okay, let's talk about your book. Yes. Yeah. Your memoir. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So I feel like I have a different view of death and what it means for us. Um, I work with a lot of people that are in grief and really traumatized by grief and grief can be the you know the deaths that we experience but also what we thought our life was going to be like what we thought our career was going to be like you know just all of these different things and so you know in sitting with people over these 20 plus years of my mental health career there's so many different avenues of grief um but then you know throughout my lifetime and experiencing all of these different deaths and, and looking at that and being able to start to see like, okay, so, you know, when, when Mike died, I could start to see the signs and the symbols and the synchronicities. I could, you know, he was like all in, he was the life of the party. So that let me go of worrying about what other people thought about me. Um, and then when my brother died, you know, he was a kid at heart. And so I talk about the inner child healing in his chapter and how important that was. And um, so what I've done is told the story of my time with them, and then the blessing or the lesson that they brought to my life. And then also the tools that came out of each of their losses. And so, um, you know, for like I was saying, for um, my brother, it's that inner child healing. Um, for um, my cousin Mike, it was about gratitude. He was a um, a doctor, and that was my background, or that was my intention growing up. And mm -hmm. he helped pave the way. Like he, um, you know, told me where to go for undergrad, and then we talked about medical school. He got me this amazing internship, and um, the I don't think I told him enough how grateful I was for his guidance throughout my lifetime. And he was a man of faith and his family meant everything to him. And I never expressed that. And we know from the research how important gratitude is. And so that's the tool at the end of that chapter of sit and think about who is important to you and what you need to say to them and want to say to them. And if they're in spirit, then say it to their soul. If they're in real life, then give them the letter, have the conversation with them. Um, with my grandma, we get into intergenerational healing um, because, you know, traumas can be passed down through the generations, but gifts can also be passed down through the generations. So we touch on that. Um, yeah, it's really, I, it's an interesting book. It's really good. And like, there's just so many different tools. Yeah. I think, you know, even if somebody's not into mediumship or plant medicine, then they can focus on the gratitude and nature. And, you know, so there's going to be 
tool music is in there as well and so there's going to be tools that resonate with different people and the stories are good stories i mean I, yeah they're my stories but i think that we all have a story to tell and i love hearing people's stories so um i think in sharing mine that starts to give other people permission to share theirs too well and i think that when you know people are brave enough to share their their stories and and their trauma and their trials and tribulations people see themselves mm -hmm. in those stories and they relate to it. And, you know, your story is going to give people hope. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, so I, I think, I think that's great. So what is your memoir called? When is it going to be out? Are there yeah. any details like that that you can say? Yeah. I don't know when it's going to be out probably about six months. It does take time. Even once it's submitted, you know, editing and there's just so many steps to it, but, um, it is going to be called blessed by death. So it's a kind of like really wanting to shift the narrative around death and what it means for us and what we can do with that journey. And it's not easy. None of this is easy, but I don't think that it's necessarily meant to be. It's meant to be like we were just talking about the journey along the way. There's not an end goal. It's choosing every day what you're going to do for yourself and do for the people around you. We were talking yesterday. I, there are like three type of people. Was it yesterday or the day before? I don't know. There was a, um, a post from like the holistic psychiatrist, psychiatrist, psychologist, whatever her name is, her Instagram page, where she talks about how it's incredibly hard. Healing is incredibly hard and it's not meant for everybody and not everybody is capable. Mm -hmm. um, and literally the one comment that stuck out was somebody saying like, what did he say? Like, uh, she said, yeah, it's, it's too, it's too hard. That's why I'm always going to be like this. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. it, you know, it was just kind of like the, yeah. So I'm just stuck being depressed because that mm -hmm. shit's too hard. You know? Yeah. So we were like, there's, I feel like there's three types of people. There are the people who like get stuck in that and they have no awareness mm -hmm. that there is, there is a way out. And then there are the people who know there's a way out, but they're like, fuck it. It's too hard. Mm -hmm. I can't. And then there are other people who are like, okay, there's a way out. I'm going to find it. Yes. I'm going to do. That. Yeah. And it then is. they also turn around and then help other people along it's, with them. Yeah. Yes. Those are the people who are in the arena, you know, and I think that anybody who's doing this work knows and recognizes when other people are, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. What is, um, so I guess what would be a piece of advice for somebody who is grieving the loss of a loved one to continue to move forward? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is redefining that relationship. So um, a big piece of my practice in the grief aspect is helping people connect with their loved ones again. And it's not about me giving messages. It's for me to allow them the space to reconnect with them and for them to have that conversation. So, you know, a lot of times there's forgiveness, you know, human life is not simple. And so there's going to be hurts and there's going to be um, heartache along the way. And sometimes we get the chance to say those things and sometimes we don't. And so opening up that space for people to have that soul to soul communication and connection is really vital and important. And that's something that people can do on their own. Um, I have a meditation, um, a guided meditation to meet a loved one in spirit, um, but it can just be sitting in your favorite spot outside and slowing down and getting connected. And, you know, having that communication so that you can forgive them, they can forgive you, you can forgive yourself, most of all, for the things that happened either during the lifetime or around the death itself. And then I think just, and this doesn't, this isn't meant to sound that way, but accepting it, accepting that this is what it is. Because I think sometimes when we're pushing against it, 
being the reality, being the truth, then that hurts even more. So it's okay. This happened. Now, how do I still maintain a relationship with them? Do I want to talk to them every day? Do I want to write a letter to them? Do I want to go see somebody that helps me connect to them? Um, but not just thinking that this is the end. And I know everybody has different religious beliefs and spiritual beliefs and all of those kinds of things. But for me, it's not just here and now. It's so much more expansive than what we can see with our our eyes right here, right now. The meditation that you were just talking about, is that something that you offer or is it like a meditation that you go to? Yeah, they can. Um, it's for free on Spotify. It's um, something that can also be purchased too. I send journal questions if they purchase it. on. It's on um, Spotify for free though too. Okay. Awesome. We'll have to drop that link. Yeah, for sure. Um, and for our listeners, the services that you offer, um, you're so expansive. Like there's like, <laughs> yes. so like, this, like we could, I've never, I've, I am not experiencing grief, but I feel like I could use you in so many ways. And I don't mean that and to sound like, <laughs> let me use you. Um, <laughs> be an incredible tool for a lot of things yes. for me um, as well. But um, what all are the, I mean, we'll obviously put a link, but like, what are some of the things that you can help with people, even if they're not going through a grieving process? Oh yeah. I have a grief or grief sessions are a small piece of the practice, but yeah, I mean, anybody that has any physical, mental, spiritual, emotional pain, which is basically all of us. Um, <laughs> yeah, everybody, everybody. Um, I do think that everybody can benefit what I offer. I just know I'm not for everyone and that's okay. Um, but yeah, so sometimes I help people work through religious trauma, um, anxiety. Um, we, if people are interested in past life regression, we can do those sessions. Um, I do a lot of the mind body connection. So people that have like chronic migraines or stomach issues or, um, you know, low back pain that they've done all of the things and they can't quite figure out um, what's going on sometimes we need to get in there and see what the body needs to let us know what we've tucked away in those spaces and those places. Um, so the mind body connection is a big one that I help a lot of people with. Um, but just, you know, hypnosis is very relaxing. It's very soothing. So it's kind of just also allowing us to de-stress, to get out of our own way, um, allowing us to let go of the ways we self-sabotage, to let go of the ways that we are um, hurting our children. You know, like when we're, when we're not healed, that spews out on the people around us. And so I help people work through triggers um, and anger and fear and, you know, all of those emotions that can bubble up that are necessary, but don't need to um, be with us for ever and ever. So many things. Yeah, so many things. Not They're all in so one. Many, yeah. <laughs> Um, and what is, how can they reach you? How can they find you? Yeah. For so, anybody who's not going to look at the bio. <laughs> <laughs> Everything is Celebrate Every Step. So my website is Celebrate Every Step, Facebook, Instagram, um, TikTok. I'm not, I'm not great at all of those kinds of things, but I'm still there somewhat. Um, and I have an email list. So I send out my emails um, every other week. And then I also have a podcast too. So it's also Celebrate Every Step. So yeah, it's pretty easy to find. Thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, thank you yeah, so much. Thank you for having me. This was I was so excited to do this because um I think it's important for people to know that professional, you know, put together, you know, you know, middle-aged moms, the you know, the plant medicine can be very helpful and expansive for so many different people in so many different walks of life. And it is something that a lot of people don't understand. So I like to get that message out there and answer those questions and um, dispel the myths and the fears around that too. So just thank you for this opportunity. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for helping break the stigma. Thank you for, you know, sharing your story, sharing um, your losses. Um, I'll be looking forward to the book. Yeah. I'm the book. I dive in, I dive all in. So yeah. I'm, I'm excited for that. And when that is out, let us know. So then we can share that okay, with our yeah, listeners. Thank you. Definitely. All right. 
Elena, thank you so much. And for all of our listeners, um, we will see you guys on the other side.